We are in this series um, on Nehemiah, and we're going to continue through that series this morning. Um, Pastor Bryce read a few uh, verses from uh, the passage we're going to take a look at this morning um, from Nehemiah chapter 6. And uh, I want to start with uh, this really incredible story. It was 1944, and uh, Bert Friesen was an infantryman. Um, he was on the front lines in Europe. And the American forces had advanced in the face of some intermittent shelling and small arms fire. But throughout the morning, uh, that had been going on, but now it got real quiet. And he was with a patrol that had reached the edge of a wooded area with a big open field that was before them. Now, unknown to the Americans that there was a battery of German soldiers who were waiting in a hedgerow. Has anybody ever heard of a hedgerow? It's just a, a row of hedges, actually. Um, and they were waiting behind the hedgerow about 200 yards across that field. And Bert was one of the two scouts who had moved out into the clearing. And once he was about halfway across the field, everybody else that was part of his battalion began to follow him. And suddenly, the Germans opened fire. And the machine gun fire actually got burnt both of his legs. And the American battalion that was following him, they all withdrew back to a point of safety. Uh, while this rapid exchange of fire, gunfire, it kept going on. And Bert was laying out helplessly next to a small stream. And he could hear the shots going over his head. And there seemed to be no way out of it. And to make matters worse, he then noticed that there was a German soldier uh, crawling toward him. Death, he thought, was imminent. He closed his eyes and he waited. And to his surprise, there was this considerable amount of time that passed without this expected attack. So he opened his eyes just to kind of see what was going on. And he was startled. He was startled to see that the German soldier was kneeling at his side and smiling. He then noticed also that the shooting had stopped. Troops from both sides of the field were watching anxiously. Without any verbal exchange, this mysterious German soldier reached down to lift Bert in his arms and proceeded to carry him to the safety of his comrades. And having accomplished his self-appointed mission and still without any words, the German soldier turned around, walked back across the field to his own troops. No one dared to break the silence of what was really a sacred moment. Moments later, the ceasefire ended, but not before all those present had witnessed how one man risked everything for an enemy. Friends, did you hear what year I said that took place? 1944. But when did the war, when did World War II end? 1945, 40, 45, right? And this phenomenal story of self-sacrifice and real leadership took place before the war ended. Unfortunately, there would be much more fighting, much more destruction, much more death, much more loss. And it would, it would be awesome to be able to stand here and share this true story and say that this was how the greatest war of the 20th century came to an end. But it isn't. And much like the passage we're going to look at this morning from Nehemiah chapter 6 and verse 7, there is still quite a threat to be dealt with. Here's what I want us to take away. Folks, when we engage in the work that God calls us to, our task may be finished, but that is often precisely the time 
when the seeds for the work that still has to be done get planted and actually begin to kind of take root. By now, in this point in the book of Nehemiah, we see that Nehemiah is unquestionably, he's a leader of leaders. Additionally, the enemies of his work, they've clearly failed in their attempts to disrupt the work or the personal safety of Nehemiah. However, even at this point, we have less of a declaration and more of a question, which is, is this truly mission accomplished? As Pastor Bryce shared this morning, so the wall was completed on the 25th day of Elul. In 52 days, when all our enemies heard about this, all the surrounding nations were afraid, lost their self-confidence because they realized that this work had been done with the help of our God. Also, in those days, the nobles of Judah were sending many letters to Tobiah and replies from Tobiah kept coming to them. Has anybody ever heard of George Washington? No, not that George Washington. George Washington Gothels. Anybody ever heard of George Washington Gothels? No? That's the man who's responsible for the completion of the Panama Canal. Have you ever heard of that? Panama Canal? But he had a big problem with the climate, with the geography. But his biggest challenge was there was growing criticism back home from those who predicted he'd never finish the project. And finally, a colleague asked him, aren't you going to answer these critics? In time, answered Gothels. Well, when, his partner asked, when the canal's finished. When the canal's finished. The best counter to all the resistance, all the negativism, all the criticism that Nehemiah has dealt with to this point is the actual completion of the rebuilding of the wall around Jerusalem. And according to what we've read here, it appears that between what we would know as mid-July and the middle of September, this absolutely exhausting work is completely finished. So it wouldn't be unreasonable, right, to think, okay, that's it, boys, wrap it up. We're done here. Um, everybody, thank you for your help. Please feel free to go your separate ways. May God bless you and keep you. It was great working with all of you. Bye-bye now. I mean, we read, we, we read what Nehemiah himself says about this point in the project when he says this. When all our enemies heard about this, the finishing of the wall, that is, all the surrounding nations were afraid and lost their self-confidence because they realized that this work had been done with the help of our God. But, but what happened next was not quite a party. Because even when the work was done, the work wasn't complete. There is still the ever-present danger specter. There's potential conflict. Jim Van Iperen says this about conflict. He says, in America, Christians have embraced two mistaken views about conflict that negatively affect what we understand about leadership. The first view sees conflict in terms of sin. The second sees conflict in terms of power. And these views are seldom verbalized, but each is based upon a set of deeply held unconscious assumptions that guide our behavior. And in the work that Nehemiah has been engaged in, it has been engulfed in conflict in one way or another from the outset. And now, as they stand on the verge of mission accomplished, we would think, of course, no more conflict. But that's not the case. Remember, as I said earlier, our task may be finished, but that's often precisely the time when the seeds for the work still to be done. That's when they get planted. The work has been finished, but disappointingly enough, Nehemiah uh, says in those days, 
the nobles of Judah were sending many letters to Tobiah. And replies from Tobiah kept coming from them. Folks, what happens oftentimes when we're doing what God has called us to do, it, it may become difficult to distinguish between friend and foe. As in the case here, these people, these nobles of Jer Judah, they've, they've been close friends, they've been confidants of Nehemiah during the rebuilding of the walls, and yet, and yet, we read that there is someone else who has become the receiver of fresh negative news and concerns can you imagine? Can you imagine that? It's, it's a situation in which perhaps maybe even innocent conversations are being repeated to Nehemiah points out as an enemy, Tobias, who then takes what he hears, he twists it, he distorts it, and seeks to do great harm. And this can happen to all of us too when we do what God's called us to do. It's why we have to work diligently to protect one another and to protect the work that God is calling us to do. We have a key moment in this rebuilding. Even, even as we, we read about the work being finished, there's this key moment. It would seem that this is where we should just kind of end the book of Nehemiah because they've finished the wall. This is where we wrap up the story. We wrap up the work. We put our pack back on and we head home. But we read in the next few verses, chapter 7, Nehemiah, it's clear that actually this is a case of mission threatened. Nehemiah 7 verse 1 says, After the walls had been rebuilt, and I had set the doors in place, the gatekeepers, the musicians, and the Levites were appointed. I put in charge of Jerusalem my brother, Hananiah, along with Hananiah, the commander of the citadel, because he was a man of integrity and feared God more than most people do. I said to them, the gates of Jerusalem are not to be opened until the sun is hot. While the gatekeepers are on duty, have them shut the doors and bar them. Also, appoint residents of Jerusalem as guards, some at their post and some near their own homes. It's, it's really telling. It's really telling that Nehemiah makes the priority at this point what becomes the priority, the first thing that kind of jumps out to us in this passage. Number one, he calls for physical protection. He calls for gatekeepers. So it's not enough just to get the, just to get the wall done. He appoints gatekeepers. And number two, he centers on spiritual development. That's why he asks for musicians and Levites. The gatekeepers are assigned the task of keeping close watch, of guarding, making sure that things that must stay outside of the city remain outside of the city. A side note here, gatekeeping is essentially what we do as parents. Really. I mean, there are things that we intentionally say, that's not coming into my home, Right? That's what the gatekeepers are doing. The gatekeepers are saying, that's not coming into the city. Whatever that is, that stays out. They're making sure that what does not belong never gets in. The folks charged with singing and, and the teaching, these are spiritual leaders from within the nation. They're Levites, a, a tribe of Israel, one of the sons of Jacob. And they function as spiritual teachers and leaders for the nation of Israel. So it's interesting. He says, we're going to keep things that should not be in out. And at the same time, we're going to reinforce. We're going to make sure that you all know that the people behind these walls know what really matters. And that is knowing and growing in our love and devotion to Yahweh. It's in doing this at this point, Nehemiah is sending a very clear message. What needs to be a priority among the people? that are now living behind these rebuilt, these rebuilt walls. He knew that it wasn't enough just to put up a wall. That's never enough just to put up a wall. No, what was needed was a plan. A plan to enhance the physical safety and protection in order 
that they could worship and grow spiritually, enhance safety and protection for the purposes of spiritual growth and worship. How many of you love the wait in line? You love it. You can't wait to go to a ball game or go. Nobody? None of you love standing in a line? I don't blame you, right? And when the lines and the wait time at a local drive through uh, coronavirus vaccine clinic became unbearable, there were some local officials who they went to find some experts on how to deal with long lines. This was in Mount Pleasant, South Carolina. And so the mayor of Mount Pleasant, his name was uh, Will Haney. He said, when I heard about this, I called Jerry and asked if he would come and help us out. Does anybody want to know what Jerry did for a living? Bingo. <laughs> Jerry was the manager of a local Chick-fil-A. It was a chain. And if you know, you go to the lines at Chick-fil-A are magic they are magic. Rarely is there a line, but if there's a line, it moves along, doesn't it? It moves along. And Mayor Haney explained how things got sorted out. And after he looked at it, talking about Jerry, after Jerry looked at it, he said, well, there's a problem right there. It's backed up because you only have one person checking people in. Then he showed us how to do it right. Jerry mobilized a bunch of volunteers from a local Rotary Club, and before long, the hour-long wait had been trimmed to how many minutes, do you think? Close, 15. Jerry is the latest in a long trend of professionals from various fields who were asked to facilitate those efforts, those vaccination efforts, and actually, the Associated Press reported that health officials in Massachusetts, they tapped Dave McGilvery. Dave McGilvery is the director of the Boston Marathon. He actually ran the vaccination attempts at both Gillette Stadium and at Fenway Park. The point being that these are people who can create plans, they can assist, they help to maximize a number for best outcomes. Nehemiah, ever vigilant, even when the work is done, he's working to maximize the safety of the people behind those walls. He tells the military leader at his side, Hananiah, and if you're not really careful, it can become a bit of a throwaway instruction, right? When he says this, he says, the gates of Jerusalem are not to be opened until the sun is hot, while the gatekeepers are still on duty. Have them shut the doors and bar them. Also appoint residents of Jerusalem as guards, some at their post, some near their own houses. Nehemiah is constantly doing whatever he must to stay one step ahead, even when the mission accomplished becomes a potential mission threatened. Nehemiah demonstrates that making provisions for the safety of others, it has to remain the top priority. Now, Nehemiah is obviously, he's an effective leader. He's a difference-making leader. He doesn't run from the challenge, but time after time, as we've been reading through this book of Nehemiah, we observe him really as kind of an ultimate problem solver. There is a gentleman by the name of John Maxwell, and he writes about problem-solving skills that leaders like Nehemiah have. The first thing he said, Maxwell says, is they anticipate problems. And that's why Nehemiah left the palace of Artaxerxes with what? Do you remember what he left with? All these supplies. He knew he would need them. Problem-solving leaders accept the truth. Nehemiah knew from the very beginning the city walls of Jerusalem were in bad shape. He didn't candy coat it. He didn't try to hide from it. He said, those walls look terrible. Problem-solving leaders see the big picture. Nehemiah had a very detailed plan for a very big picture. Problem-solving leaders handle one thing at a time. Nehemiah knew he had a multitude of problems. 
But as we've read to this point, he handled one thing, then he moved on to the next, then he moved on to the next. Problem-solving leaders don't give up on a major goal when they're down. And there have been a lot of rough patches in this story to this point, but we have seen that there has never been a time when Nehemiah made major decisions about continuing or discontinuing the work when things got difficult. I want to close with this story this morning. There was a boxer named Gene Tunney. Anybody ever heard the name Gene Tunney? Gene Tunney. He was a heavyweight champion. He beat a name you might have heard, Jack Dempsey. He beat Jack Dempsey. And what most people don't know about Gene Tunney, that when he started out his professional career, he was a power puncher. In other words, the guy would just try to hit you like a load of bricks. That was all he could do. That was all he could bring to the table. But before he turned professional, he actually broke both of his hands. Now, that's an interesting story. I don't know that story, but he broke both of his hands. His doctor and his manager, they then told him that he would never be world champion as a result of having broken both of his hands. But he didn't deter him from doing that. He said, if I can't be a champion as a puncher, then I'll make it as a boxer. He learned and became one of the most skillful boxers ever to become a champion. John Maxwell... Gene Tunney, they both make it clear that in their own way, that challenges that come to us, they, that's, what, that's what problem solving leaders do. They solve challenges. They, they don't let the challenges become the end of us. And when you look at the story of Nehemiah, <laughs> the challenge he faced here was not the end of his story. So I encourage you today as we learn about Nehemiah and continue to learn his story, be encouraged. Be encouraged. Let's pray. God, we are grateful for this, these truths that come to us. Lord, we can look in your word and we see these stories. Incredible difficulty, incredible hardship that your people have gone through. And God, you continue to walk with them. They continue to walk with you. And Lord, in this account from Nehemiah, just when it looked like everything was about to be done, uh, Lord, yet there is another issue that seems to rise to the surface. Nehemiah is ready. May we be ready. Whatever it is that you've called us to, however you called us to live in this life, Lord, may we always be ready to walk where you lead, trusting in your leadership, Lord, so that we can do the work you've called us to, so we can, maybe it's something we need to be rebuilding, perhaps it's something we need to be surrendering, Lord, something we need to be living. May we May we do that, knowing that you are with us. We're not alone. We love you. We thank you. Thank you for this story of this incredible, this incredible man from among your people. We pray this in your son's name. Amen. Amen.